Hi everyone, I'm going to talk about six key things to know about medieval Europe. This time period in Europe, again, we're still in 600 to 1450. This is called the Middle Ages, or sometimes called medieval Europe. This is a review that this area had previously been part of the Roman Empire, and when all these different Germanic groups came in and invaded Rome, the Western Empire fell in 476. The Eastern part continued on as the Byzantine Empire, which we just learned about. So this, the Western part had been conquered and all divided up between these different Germanic groups. So the consequences of this is that Europe was no longer united. Um, even the Western part was not united. Uh, the Franks, who were some of the most successful of the Germanic tribes, set up large kingdoms in Western Europe. But you can see here that there's no central authority. So Rome, which had used its rule of law to keep order for so many years, those laws are no longer being enforced. The Roman military, which had protected people and tried to stop invasions, that's gone. And the Roman infrastructure becomes more limited. So think about how the Romans were especially known for their roads and their aqueducts and all of these things that made life easier. Now there's no one to maintain those things or no money to maintain them. So the first key concept about medieval Europe is invasions and instability. If you look at the map at the top, you can see that Europe was experiencing invasions by three major groups. The Vikings, who are in purple, came from Scandinavia, and they especially targeted monasteries and churches because those were centers of wealth. Uh, and you can see they came down throughout Western Europe um, and attacked people. They also, we learned, went over eastward, um, past Novgorod and into Kiev and established Russia, the first Russian kingdom, Kievan Rus. The red arrows are Muslims coming across from North Africa, and then the Magyars are a nomadic group represented in green from Hungary. And so the problems of these invasions would be magnified by the lack of central authority because people in the West had dealt with invasions before, but usually they had some amount of military protection from the Romans. Now that's gone, and so people are pretty much left to fend for themselves, and so these invasions are even more scary than they would have been in the time of the Romans. The Vikings are known for their ships. Uh, the Viking ships are called longboats, which you see here, and they have a shallow hull. This is important because if you look at the bottom picture especially, you can see the bottom of the boat is very shallow. Like if it's in the water, it's not going to sink down very much. And so this is significant because the Vikings could sail even up rivers because they had these shallowed hulled vessels and people didn't expect to be attacked inland, um, but the Vikings launched surprise attacks even not just on the coast, but inland um, as they were doing these raids. So the Vikings are often portrayed as just very warlike and um, killing people, invading, and they did do that. But they're also traders. So if you look at this map, it's interesting to see what major places they reached. Yes, they went to Western Europe. Remember, they also went eastwards towards Russia. And then you can see they went to Iceland, Greenland, and even Newfoundland, which is today part of Canada. So they crossed all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Eventually, in the later part of the Middle Ages, the Vikings adopted farming and stopped raiding, and they became just like normal European settled people. Um, and so they kind of assimilated into Western Europe uh, and settled and became farmers. The second major thing to know about medieval Europe are the Crusades, what they were and what their impact was. So the Crusades were a series of invasions of the Middle Eastern Muslims by European Christians attempting to capture the Holy Land. So remember... We learned about the Muslim empires in this region, like the Abbasids. Um, the Christians want to come from Europe and take that land over. The Holy Land would be the land like around Jerusalem and other holy sites, places that are holy to both Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So how did this all start? Well, the Byzantine emperor, because remember the Byzantine empire is 
partially in the Middle East and kind of right next to the Middle East, um, they were being attacked by the Arabs. And so they wrote to the Pope, the Byzantine emperor, and asked for help against these invasions, like saying, we're Christian, we need the help of our Christian brothers in Europe to come help us from these other people of a different religion. And so Pope Urban II officially called for the First Crusade. And they used the term infidels, which is a European derogatory term for Muslim, um, kind of saying like they're not, they're barbaric, and we need to go defend our Byzantine friends from these people. So this started in the 10 hundreds, the late 10 hundreds. Um, if we think about why would Europeans want to participate? Well, there were some people who were guided by religious fervor, like they're very religious. And so this argument that we're going to take back this land for Christianity from Islam was appealing to them. There were people who just wanted adventure and travel. In this time period, most people would have never traveled more than 10 miles away from where they were born ever. And so the idea that you could get on a ship and sail across the Mediterranean and go to some far off land um, and fight people, I mean, that sounded really good to some young, especially young men. Some hoped to become wealthy or famous, like become heroes in the wars, and that that would help their social standing. It was also something for knights to do. So I'm going to talk about the knights in medieval Europe, but the knights are the trained warriors, and so this was a, like something to channel their energy into. So the First Crusade began in 1098, and because the Christians had the element of surprise here, like the Muslims didn't know they were coming, um, they were initially successful and set up uh, four small Christian kingdoms. If you look at this map, so you can see the First Crusade is actually um, the purple lines going over through Constantinople and then down into the Middle East. So you can see if you look on the Eastern Mediterranean, you can see Jerusalem. These are the areas that the Christians were wanting to conquer in the Crusades. And so initially they were successful. One of the impacts of this is that the Italian city-states became very important for trade. If you look at the map, Italy is kind of right in the center as the Christians are going from Europe over to the Middle East. And so Italy became a natural stopping point. So on their journey, they would stop there and buy supplies and food and keep going. And so this trade generated a lot of wealth for Italian city-states like Venice. So they were initially successful in the First Crusade. The Second and Third Crusades, Europeans lost territory to the Muslims, um, led by General Saladin. And if you think about that, I mean, I think it should not be that surprising because we studied all the achievements and advancements of the Muslim cultures at this time um, and how they had all of this technology. The Europeans are behind in that at this point. So I think it's not that surprising that they would be uh, defeated. In the Fourth Crusade, the Christians became involved in a dispute in the Byzantine Empire over who was the rightful ruler of the Byzantine Empire, and they actually attacked Constantinople in 1204 over this issue. They never even made it to the Holy Land. Um, and this is ironic because the Byzantines were the ones that started it by asking for help against invasions, and the Crusaders like never even made it there and invaded them instead. Um, so the Crusades went on for about 200 years. There's a series of Crusades. There's even more than the fourth one um, where people keep going. But the Christians don't really gain any uh, permanent territory in the Middle East. So what are the effects of all this? Well, cultural diffusion is one thing. The Europeans were exposed to Arab learning and recovered classical writings. So think about all the achievements we did in math and science, astronomy, medicine, etc., of the Arabs, Europeans start to learn about those things. They also recovered classical writing. So remember Western Europe, the Roman Empire has fallen. People are certainly not concerned about maintaining Roman literature. They're just concerned with surviving and not getting killed. And so the Arabs had translated those works into Arabic. And so the Europeans could translate them back and start recovering some of that knowledge that had been lost in Europe. It also led to a lot more trade between Europe and the Middle East. Italy, as I mentioned, especially benefited, um, and a lot of Eastern goods came to Europe. So the Silk Road at this particular point wasn't really reaching Europe like it was under the Romans, and so this helped them kind of revive some trade with the East. 
It also intensified animosity between Christians and Muslims, which should be understandable, right? Because the Christians came over and attacked the Muslim empires um, and so created animosity between those two religions. So here's a famous quote. Uh, the Crusades were one of history's most successful failures. And if you think about that, the Crusades really didn't achieve their original goals. I mean, they wanted to take back the Holy Land, and they did not do that. Um, but we could argue that the Crusades in some ways were successful. So if you think about which side benefited more, probably the Christians, because the Christians got increased trade, they got exposure to new learning and technology, the Muslims were more advanced at this time, and so they didn't really have that much to gain uh, from the Europeans. So it's successful for Europe because they start really moving forward with all everything they're exposed to from the Arab cultures. The third thing to know about is the power of the Catholic Church. So the church was the most powerful institution in Europe in the Middle Ages. Why were they so powerful? Well, people were very religious and very concerned with going to heaven. And this is partly because of the lives that they lead. Remember, they were under invasion. They um, don't have the Roman protection anymore. So it's this very scary time to be living in Western Europe. And so the idea that when this life is over, a person is going to go to heaven and that's going to be a paradise um, and they're going to live eternally a good life in heaven and not have to deal with like all these issues that are existing on earth. People really wanted that. That really appealed to them. Um, and so another thing that gave the church power is they administered sacraments. Sacraments are like rituals um, that people do that the church says that you're supposed to do. Communion, confession, baptism. And so people thought that those things would help them in their journey to salvation or to heaven. And because the church controlled those, it, became, it gave the church a lot of control over people. Clergy also served, as lord, served lords as vassals. So clergy are church officials, and they were tied into the feudal system, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and that'll make more sense. All Christians were supposed to give 10% of their earnings to the church. This is called a tithe. Um, and today, uh, most Christian churches still say that you should give 10% of your earnings to the church, but it's not mandatory. No one's going to... Um, come to your house if you don't pay that. In this time, it's really almost like a tax. Like that's a mandatory thing that you need to do. The church was also the largest landowner in Europe. So that gave them a lot of power. The Pope even ruled a kingdom in Italy called the Papal States. So the Pope was like a king as well as a religious leader. He had a lot of political power. He went to war, all the things that kings do. And then monasticism is also still important. So if we think about why a woman would want to become a nun, um, some women didn't do it voluntarily. Their families forced them to become nuns. But there are some women that entered um, to be a nun uh, because they wanted to. And if you think women didn't really have many options at this point, it's become a wife and mother. There's really nothing else for you to do unless you become a nun. If you become a nun, you have the chance of being educated and having kind of more of a life um, that you make more of your own decisions. Monasteries during this time in Europe became centers for learning. Most people in Western Europe were illiterate, and the church officials tended to be the people who were educated. Monks played a really important role in Western Europe in preserving books and manuscripts. So you can see here, um, books were all handwritten at this time, so the average person would not have been able to own a book or any kind of reading material. But monks copied these different things by hand, and that helped preserve information. Schools and universities that did exist were also run by the church and emphasized theology. So most people would have never attended school, but those that did exist were usually affiliated with the church, and so they promoted the Catholic Church's views through those educational institutions. All right, number four is feudalism and farming. So invasions and lack of central authority made Europe very dangerous. So think about if the Vikings could come at any time and you have no military protection, you're living in a state of fear. And so people turned to the local aristocracy for protection because the local aristocracy usually lived on large estates 
Like they had a large home or a castle and then they would have walls around it for protection. And so if the people could get into that estate, then they would be more protected than if they're just out in a village somewhere where no one is protecting them. And so this led to a new political system called feudalism and a new economic system called manorialism. So feudalism is political, manorialism is economic. If you look at this diagram here, you can see at the top of the feudal system is the king. Below him are the lords. They could be called aristocracy, lords, nobles, all different terms. Below them are the knights. Those are the warriors. And below them are the peasants, also called serfs. We also have this, lord, this word vassal in here. A vassal is just somebody who serves someone above them. So like the lords serve the king, they're the king's vassals. The knights serve the lord, they're the lord's vassals. And vassals made an oath of loyalty to their lord or king called homage. They also had a feudal contract. Sometimes the contract was written, sometimes it was just kind of an understanding. And so what a vassal is supposed to do for the lord is provide military service advise him, give him uh, specified financial payments, and be loyal to him. And in response to that, the Lord is supposed to defend the vassal. Like if he gets into trouble um, in a court or something, he'll defend him. And most importantly, they give a grant of land called a fief. Lords and knights are supposed to uh, follow a code of chivalry in the Middle Ages. And you can see here just some of the, a sample of some of the things that would be included. So protect the weak, fight wrong, seek justice, be loyal, be fair, be gentle and brave, generous, honor and respect women, live for God and love his church. So it's just like they're supposed to have good character, um, protect people, treat women well, be loyal, that sort of thing. So a vassal had authority over his fief, and this was usually a large estate with a castle or a large house and the surrounding farmland, and that whole thing together, the, the buildings and the farmland are called a manor. And so serfs are peasants who moved on to the manor for protection, so they want to live behind the walls of the manor and be protected by the lord. But in exchange for that, they enter into a contract with the lord where they're legally tied to the land. So the serfs had a contract with the lord of the manor. They have to provide labor, pay rent, and pay for certain services. So provide labor would include farming. So the lord is going to have all of this land, and he's going to want some of it farmed just for himself so that he can feed his people, he can maybe sell some food and get some money. Um, but then the serfs also have to grow food to feed their own families. So for part of the week, they'd grow food for the lord, Part of the week, they would farm for their own families. But on the land that they're farming for their own families, they don't own that land, and so they have to pay rent to the Lord for it. And by 800 CE, it's estimated that about 60% of the peasants in Europe had become serfs. And here's a little illustration of uh, what a manor might look like. So... It's a large estate. You can see there's a main home uh, where the Lord and his family would live. There's little huts where the serfs would live. The serfs are out in the field farming. And then there's other buildings here too, like a stable and a mill and a church and all kinds of things. So the manor was supposed to be kind of self-sufficient. Like you wouldn't even have to leave the manor to do anything and you wouldn't want to because it's scary out there and the world's off the manor. Um, so like it's very self-contained and they have everything they need right there. So farming is by far the most important economic activity. As the invasions died down in the second half of the Middle Ages, the population of Europe started to grow. The technology in this time period is pretty limited, um, but there were some new things related to farming. So the mold board, which is a type of plow that you see here, and a new horse collar, um, which was improved where they can, like the horse wears a collar, but they can pull stuff and it doesn't choke the horse. And then the three-filled system of crop rotation. So if you look at the little illustration, this is a system where they would divide their fields into three and leave one field fallow where there's no um, crops growing. 
and then rotate the fallow field every few years. And so that would give the nutrients in the soil time to replenish. So half the manor's land was farmed by the serfs for the lords. So that's the labor part. And then half the manor's land was for serfs to farm to feed their families. Again, because they don't own that land, they have to pay rent to the lord in the form of crops. The lord also had a lot of restrictions over the serfs. They couldn't leave the manor without his permission. They couldn't marry without his permission. If they were accused of a crime, they could be put on trial by the lord. And they also had to pay for use of any of the lord's tools. Like the main food of people in the Middle Ages is bread. And whatever kind of grain you're growing, before you can turn it into bread, you need to grind it down into flour so you can bake bread. Um, to use the mill, they had to pay the Lord for that. So there's a lot of restrictions and uh, things that the, or obligations that the serfs owe to the Lord. The fifth thing you need to know about is the Black Death. Um, the Black Death is a outbreak of bubonic plague. Bubonic plague there have been outbreaks of bubonic plague throughout all of history. Even if you Google bubonic plague, you'll see people have had it just in the last few years, even in the United States. But this is a particularly large outbreak of the Black Death that occurred in the thir of, a, of the bubonic plague that occurred in the 1300s. The bubonic plague probably originated in Asia and was spread by the Mongols as they conquered land. So we haven't learned about the Mongols yet, but if you look over north of China, where those arrows originate, um, that's Mongolia, where the Mongols came from. The Mongols conquered territory all the way west over to Russia. And so as they uh, transported people and goods all throughout that area, they probably brought the Black Death with them. And then you can see it went down into the Mediterranean and then up through trade into the rest of Europe. Also notice it went all through the Middle East and through North Africa. So even though we're talking about Europe in this PowerPoint, it's important to remember that the Black Death also impacted Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. It was probably spread by fleas on rats, and there's been some new um, scholarship on that in the last few years where some scholars believe that that's not the case. Um, but uh, it probably did not help that rats and fleas and all of those were really common in the Middle Ages, um, and so if those, any kind of animal was carrying disease, that would have been an issue. The impacts of this, at least a third of the population in Europe died, and serfdom decreased in Western Europe as a result. So feudalism started to break down. A lot of this has to do with the fact that so many people died. So if a lot of the serfs die, the Lord is going to be short on labor. And so he's going to have to try to recruit people to come work for him. The only way you're going to do that is to pay people. So the, the serfs, remember, are not paid. They just get to use some of the land, and they have to pay for that. Um, so it's just they're just getting protection and a little bit of land to farm. So what happens is that the lords have to start paying actual wages to people, and so the serfs leave the manor to go to wherever they can make the most money. It also led to a decrease in the power of the Catholic Church, which I think makes sense if you think People were extremely religious. And so think about if you were very religious and prayed for your family not to be impacted by the Black Death and all these people died, it just caused people to kind of question their faith a little bit more. Um, you can also see this illustration, which we'll look at in more detail later, um, but uh, death became a common thing depicted in art like you see here. The next thing are, is the Hanseatic League and towns. So later in the Middle Ages, like in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, towns grew again. Why did this occur? So people are moving off the manor back to towns. Well, feudalism broke down. Remember, trade had increased as a result of the Crusades. The invasions, like the Vikings, remember, they settled down and became farmers, so they're no longer attacking and people feel safer. Um, and the Italian city-states are a good example of this. So remember, the Italian city-states like Venice became wealthy through trade as a result of the Crusades. So a lot of people, when the Roman Empire had fallen, had left towns because they weren't safe and moved on to the manor. Now people are leaving the manor, and they're going back to towns that had existed before. 
As towns grew, trade between, between towns also grew, and one trading organization that developed is called the Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic League is a group of northern European cities that encouraged and regulated trade. So if you look on the map here, all the red dots are cities that were part of the Hanseatic League. So they're encouraging trade between those different cities. The rise and fall of cities in this time period, 600 to 1450, is something that's occurring all over the world. So again, even though we're talking about Europe right now, this is something that's a key theme here. Um, and let's look at a couple reasons why. So first reasons why people would be leaving cities. Invasions. So we learned about the Vikings. We're going to learn about the Mongols. We've also learned about the Arabs and how they conquered a ton of territory. So invading groups cause people to leave cities. Disease. So diseases like the bubonic plague and smallpox reduced populations. Number three, a decline in agriculture. So like with all the invasions and deaths from disease, there were fewer people to farm. And so like if we don't have enough food, the population naturally decreases. And then also the Little Ice Age, which we're going to learn about in more detail soon too. The Little Ice Age is a period of general cooling um, that lasted several hundred years. And so that just caused populations to shrink and people, um, population to decline. So if you look at these cities under that that are declining, there are a lot of the big classical cities that we learned about, like Rome, Athens, Alexandria, Chang'an, Pataliputra. People are leaving those cities that had been major centers during this period because of those reasons. Now, other cities emerged and took their place. End of invasions. So, like the Vikings eventually settled down. The Mongols eventually lost control by the end of the 1300s. Safe transportation. So, as we have more large empires like the Abbasids, like the Mongols, you can travel within that empire often relatively safely on trade routes. Rise in trade and the end of the Little Ice Age by the end of this time period. More farms. So in places where they started farming more and developed new technology, it led to more people and more labor. So new cities rose as centers of trade. Novgorod in Russia, Timbuktu in West Africa, Baghdad in the Middle East, Guangzhou in China, Venice in Italy, and Calicut in India. And lastly, another thing that goes along with towns and trade are guilds. We talked about this briefly in the Middle East in the Abbasids. A guild is just an organization of artisans who all make the same thing. So it's like a union, like all the bakers, all the blacksmiths, whatever. They form a union to regulate the industry. So they do things like educate new artisans. A lot of them developed an apprentice system. They also controlled quality, how much was produced, and what the prices of the goods would be. So that is a summary of six important things to know about medieval Europe. If you missed anything, feel free to go back.